Aloha, ladies and gentlemen. How's everyone doing tonight? Aloha. Oh, I think we can do it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> How's everyone doing tonight? <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you folks so much for being here tonight. We really appreciate you guys attending. Uh, my name is Jessica. I'm the Education Director here at the Maui Ocean Center. Um, welcome to the Maui Ocean Center's Sea Talk Speaker Series. We're so excited to have everyone here. My job is to go over the housekeeping details for you folks this evening. Uh, I've managed to touch base with a couple of you folks already, but just for those who haven't uh, uh, bumped into me yet. The program will go from 6 to 7 p.m. and that's going to be the formal presentation followed by a 15-minute question and answer session with the audience. So once uh, Doug is done with his formal presentation, we do have staff that will walk up through the audience with another microphone. We are doing a live stream, so it is helpful to wait for um, the microphone to get to you just so the folks listening to the live stream can hear your question and then Doug will answer them. And then uh, after 15 minutes we are going to wrap the formal part of the presentation and we're going to be making our way over to the Maui Ocean Treasures which is our retail store where Doug is going to be doing some uh, book signing which is very exciting. I'll talk more about that at the end of the formal presentation. Um, if you need to exit the sphere for any reason during the presentation you can make your way to the nearest stairs and out the exit doors on either side. There are exit doors and they are unlocked. Um, we just ask that you find the stairwell nearest you so we don't climb over everybody. Um, the doors are unlocked so you can re-enter through the same door when you're done. Um, and the closest restrooms are located just outside of this door here immediately to your left. Again, you can make your way back in once you've exited. Um, we do ask that you guys silence or put your phones on vibrate out of respect for our speaker. Thank you guys so much for helping us out with that. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, our guest speaker this evening. Just a short synopsis on Dr. Douglas Fenner. He's been studying coral reefs for over 35 years, first in the Caribbean, then in Hawaii, and now across the entire Pacific. He works on corals in the Philippines for two years, and then Australia for six years, and so far 20 years in American Samoa. Dr. Fenner has over 45 published scientific papers, three books, and a dozen field guides to corals in different parts of the Pacific. 
Pacific. His newest book, Corals of Hawaii, the second edition, is out now uh, and only available at the Maui Ocean Center's retail store, Maui Ocean Treasures. He's a part of he's a part-time contractor for NOAA, teaching people to identify coral species so that we have better information to help corals avoid extinction. Tonight he'll dive into the threats of coral reefs worldwide and how coral resilience and conservation can save them. Without any further delay, please help me provide a warm welcome to Dr. Douglas Fenner. Thank you very much. Um, probably most of you have heard the news that basically coral reefs are in deep trouble. And that's true. The question then I want to start trying to address tonight is can we save coral reefs? And by the end I will have an answer for you, I hope. And maybe it might even be true. Okay. Uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit about what coral reefs are, give you a little background, and then get into the problem of threats. So the plan for this talk is to talk about what are coral, tropical coral reefs and how do they form, uh, what are corals, uh, what are polyps, nematocysts, zooxanthellae, and skeleton, and uh, what other organisms are on coral reefs. There's lots of different kinds of organisms on coral reefs. In fact, they're hugely diverse. They're probably the second most diverse ecosystem on the planet following tropical rainforests, which have insects, which are the most diverse group of organisms on the planet. Uh, and coral reefs don't have insects, basically. They have a few, very few. Um, uh, but they have lots of other things. And there are actually more phyla of animals on coral reefs than any other ecosystem on the planet, certainly, certainly uh, rainforests. Um, so what are some of those other organisms? And um, what are, uh, role uh, do fish play on coral reefs? There's lots of fish. A lot of people uh, love those uh, beautiful fish swimming around. And uh, then uh, what are the threats? What are the major threats to coral reefs? There are many threats, from, mostly from humans. OK, um, coral reefs, basically, um, the term coral reefs is actually a bit ambiguous. We use it all the time. But I've come to think that actually there's two different aspects of coral reefs that are very different, and they're very tightly entwined and kind of easily confused. And basically, one thing is the geological structure. It's made of calcium carbonate. And calcium carbonate is not alive. It's a mineral. Uh, it can dissolve easily, and there's lots of it dissolved in the water, and corals take it from the water and build hard skeletons out of it that pile up and become gigantic reefs. Not all reefs are gigantic, but the Great Barrier Reef is as long as from Seattle to San Diego, California. It has 2,500 reefs in it. It has enough material to build 40,000 copies of the Great Pyramid of Egypt that is 40 stories tall. It ain't small. And Indonesia has as much coral reef as Australia. Australia and Indonesia have the largest coral reefs of any countries in the world. Both have 16% of the world's coral reefs. The Philippines has 8%. Eastern Indonesia, uh, the Philippines, Northern New Guinea and the Solomon Islands have the richest coral reef diversity in the world. That's the top of the mountain. Um, and it's fantastic. It's estimated that world coral reefs have 800,000 species in them. Uh, they're wonderfully diverse. It also makes a little bit of a problem to try to study that many fit corals. We actually have not documented anywhere close to uh, the place with the largest number of species that have been documented is New Caledonia, and there is a book that is an inch thick that does nothing but lists the names of the species. Nothing about them, just the names. And it's 8,000 species, and the world has 800,000. So there we go. So um, basically, the organisms that build coral reefs are corals and the particular types of algae. There's some kinds of algae that uh, produce solid calcium coral uh, carbonate. 
but corals are critical. They're critical for coral reefs. They act to hold the sand in between the dead skeletons so the waves don't wash it away. It's called baffling. That's what the geologists call it. Um, and they keep it from being washed away by waves. Um, and diversity is often said in coral reefs to be very high. Uh, originally, some people said it was the high, most diverse in the world. It is not. Tropical rainforests have more because they have insects, but it is very high. It's probably the second highest. But within coral reefs, there's a huge variation. So those places that I just mentioned have super diverse reefs. Uh, American Samoa is sort of medium high diversity. Hawaii is lower. And if you get to Brazil, they only have a handful of corals and a handful of species of fish. The Caribbean has perfectly well-growing coral reefs until things went bad in recent times due to humans. And coral reefs build there just as they do in the Pacific. And they have a completely different set of organisms, fish, corals, algae, you name it. And they have much lower diversity um, than uh, the highest reefs. And they still build coral reefs just fine. Um, so um, the, what do coral reefs need in order to grow? They need basically warm, shallow, sunny, warm water, ocean water. Corals only live in salt water. They don't even live in brackish water. They can't live in fresh water. They have to be in warm, shallow water. They're not in, trop in coral in high latitude cold areas. Um, and they aren't in fresh water. And so they're very picky. They only live uh, in these places. Actually, the water is usually clear on coral reefs. There are corals that can live just fine in very murky water, especially if the settlement, uh, sediment doesn't settle on them. It can be murky. Uh, then they're restricted to a bit shallower because less sunlight due to the murky water. But they can live in murky water. And they're not nearly as well studied there. There are a bunch of different kinds of reefs. And the basic uh, three kinds of reefs uh, was first uh, probably outlined by Darwin. He wrote a whole book on coral reefs. He's famous for the origin of species. And he actually discovered two different kinds of evolution. And he was an expert in a huge volume on barnacles, another book on worms, another book on uh, um, carnivorous plants. And, uh, anyhow, uh, he came up with the distinctions of three kinds of reefs. Here's a picture of a fringing reef in American Samoa I took from the window of a plane just about to land or take off. I've forgotten which way we were going. And basically, at the top, you see greenery, which is the trees on land. You see a thin line of white beach there, which is coral sand. You see some light bluish green there, which are pools. Those are called back reef pools. Not every reef has them. The sort of brownish stripe along before the white is the reef flat, which is shallow and nearly flat and usually doesn't have a lot of coral on it, but is part of the coral reef. And then the place where all the waves are breaking is called the reef crest. It's the shallowest place. It's the most dangerous place to try to study coral reefs. Not many people uh, get in there and survive. And then to so the lower right, there's the reef slope. So that's where it's sloping down into deeper water. A lot of people think that's the coral reef. That's part of the coral reef, but it's not all of the coral reef. Uh, so basically, I forgot to say, I was starting to make the distinction between the calcium carbonate, the geological structure of the coral reef, which can be huge. So the Great Barrier Reef, it's extremely long. It's also thick in some places. Uh, and um, basically, the first place where we knew how thick they could be was in, on uh, Bikini Atoll, where the United States exploded a series of atomic bombs. Um, early in the history of developing atomic bombs, they tested them there. And uh, there was a lot of money from the US government to find out where the radiation went. So they drilled a hole. There had been previous attempts to drill down through particularly atolls to find out where the bottom of it is, to find out what, how it was formed. And basically, they'd never hit what was underneath. At Ainuit, at uh, Bikini Atoll, they hit it about a mile deep, actually closer to a kilometer deep. Um, 
and underneath was volcanic rock. It's built on top of a volcano. Um, so that's a geological structure, and at the bottom, they could determine the age of the corals, and it was 60 million years old. So that's an old reef that's been building for a very long time. Okay, so that's the geological structure that's not alive, but the other thing that coral reefs refer to is the ecosystem of the living organisms that are on the surface and in the holes. And they're much entwined because reefs are full of holes. They're absolutely porous full of holes. And there's organisms all the way through, right down to bacteria size, uh, but others that are specialized to live in the dark in little holes. And so they're very intertwined, but you can separate the two. And part of the problem is that people will talk about reef and say, oh, this reef is dead. Well. Guess what? The geological stroke structure was never alive. The ecosystem was alive, and what they're talking about there is the ecosystem, and particularly that the corals might be dead. Anyhow, so those are two completely different things. On rare occasions, they get separated. So there are a few coral reefs on land that are fossil coral reefs. So there are whole structures that, you, that grew in the ocean and then got lifted out of water by some geological process. And all the organisms are dead now because it's out in the air. But the uh, geological structure is there. And you can actually find dead coral fossils in the reef. Um, and there are other places in the world in where, for instance, uh, there's a place in Australia where every year they get big waves that basically rip all the corals off and the corals are growing directly on terrestrial rocks and they just get up to some size and then they all get ripped out. And outside of bays on points here in, uh, in uh, uh, Hawaii, that happens too. And the first corals come back are, are these corals that some people call cauliflower corals and they grow back and then the next big storm just rips them all out and then they come back and that's all a natural process. But basically, in Australia, that, those, there's no geological structure. There's no buildup of the dead skeletons underneath the living skeletons. So it's a coral reef ecosystem without the geology. And with the fossil coral reef, it's a geology without the living organisms. You can separate them, but normally they're tightly entwined. And of course, the living organisms produce the geology. That doesn't happen on land, but it happens in oceans and it's been going on with different organisms for about, eh, maybe about 500 million years, not long, you know, um, you know that, that their whole series of different organisms have built reefs in the ocean by taking calcium carbonate out of the water. There's abundant calcium carbonate in the water and making it into solid stuff. So, fringing reefs are right along the shore line of uh, a, um, now, how do I get out of that? Okay, yeah, this is the next one. Next kind, fringing reefs are right along the shoreline of an island. Most of the island uh, reefs, uh, coral reefs in Hawaii, particularly the main Hawaiian islands, are fringing reefs, like a fringe on a coat along the edge. New Caledonia has a barrier reef, and this is what a barrier reef looks like when it's in the simplest form. New Caledonia's reefs, a barrier reef is the second largest in the world. Third largest is Belize. Biggest is the Great Barrier Reef. But the Great Barrier Reef has at least 2,500 reefs in it. I don't think a single person has ever seen every one of them. Um, it's a gigantic reef. Uh, New Caledonian Reef, here in the middle, you see stripes of coral, basically. On the right is the deep ocean. On the left is a lagoon. It's much shallower than the deep uh, ocean. Deep ocean is on the order of two to three miles deep. The lagoon is only somewhere between about 100 and 300 feet deep. So it's relatively shallow. And it's all sand at the bottom. It's all reef sand in the bottom of a lagoon, usually. So a barrier reef is a barrier to navigation that has a lagoon between it and the land. And uh, that's the second largest in the world. I took a picture out the window of an airplane once. Here's a picture probably from a satellite of an atoll. And an atoll is what puzzled people for a long time because it's a ring of coral with no land in sight. No other kind of structure, uh, geological structure. It's just a ring of sand and it's an amazingly difficult place for humans to live. There are 
uh, several countries that are composed only of atolls. And these people are very afraid of what's going to happen with sea level rise because they've got no place to go. The highest spots are often about six feet above sea level, and most of it's only a couple of feet two to three feet above sea level. And sometimes in the Marshall Islands and some other places, when they have the biggest tides, the tide waters, the ocean waves can go right through your house. If you want to see what uh, ocean water does to what you have in your house, having an ocean wave go right through your house is not a very good thing to have happen. If you drive through with your car through ocean water, kiss it goodbye, because everything will rust, and it'll fall apart right in front of your eyes. It is really rough on them. It was a tough place to live the whole time. There is no running water. The only water is down in the sand. And in that water is everything that ever came on the surface of the sand. And if you have very many people, that's not a very place, good place to get your water. It's a tough place to live. Um, on this, the light white is the sand. The dark areas on these very thin rim of the atoll are, are vegetated areas with, with trees. It's a tiny place. In Majuro of the Marshall Islands, when you land, the airport runway is almost the entire width of the island. And it looks like the wingtips are over water when you land. That's how small it is. Oh my gosh, what a place to live. But a wonderful coral reef. And then in the middle is the lagoon, relatively shallow, lots of water, and a few little spots that are little patch reefs that grow there. Anyhow, I'm hitting the wrong buttons, which don't help. How do I get out of that? Okay. I'm hitting the, okay, here we go, here we go. Reef zonation. Within a reef, there are zones with different depths. Zonation was probably first discovered on uh, temperate shorelines in which you find different organisms attached on rocks at different altitude, different elevations above the sea level because they get different amounts of seawater time immer being immersed in water, and some organisms can stand more time out in air than others. Those are the ones high up and farther down and those are the ones that are less tolerant. On coral reefs, there's zonation with depth. So as you go down into deeper water, there are coral species and other organisms that can take less light. And up in shallow water, there are organisms that can take more light and more uh, wave action. And so there's lots of zonation. And across the reef, as you come from land, you first go over this shallow thing called a reef flat. Then you get the reef crest where the waves break. Reef slopes as you go down. And then below normal scuba diving depths, the light is getting dimmer and dimmer. And they call it mesophotic, medium amounts of light. Deeper than that, there's very little light. You can probably see at depths at which, you know, once your uh, eyes are dark adapted, you can see a little bit at depths at which they can't do photosynthesis. And so uh, mosophotic is where corals and algae uh, live that can survive in less light and do still do enough photosynthesis to survive. So. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other uh, things like uh, wave action that become less at depth. And so it's zoned. Some corals only live shallow. Some only live deep. Some have wider ranges. Some only live at medium. And so you need to look at all that to find uh, the different species of corals. And just to give you a few uh, uh, glimpses of what different reefs look like, this is a picture from American Samoa back reef pool, pool that's full of these rounded corals of different colors and different species, different shapes, different sizes. Here's a picture from the American Samoa National Marine Sanctuary called Fongatelli Bay. And it is really this beautiful underwater. But notice, how many fish can you see? Do you see any sharks? If you go to the Northwest Amer uh, Hawaiian Islands, the place is crawling with sharks. And that's a place where humans have not been fishing. It is pristine there in a way in which very few, left, few uh, reefs left in the world are pristine and unaffected by humans. Very minimally affected. And one of the first effects of humans is to overfish the big fish. And there's lots of little fish in a place like the Philippines where there's huge numbers of poor people who need food desperately. And, but the big fish are gone. 
And basically, there are a few sharks left in American Samoa um, and almost every other place that there are humans. The big fish are overfished. On the other hand, the small fish, when you get down to little fish like this, those little fish living in holes, nobody eats. They're too small. They're never fished. They can't be overfished. They're not fished. And they're the majority. The very largest families of fish are all tiny. Gobies, blennies, and damselfish. They're the most diverse. The big fish, there's only a few species. So the impacts are very dependent on the size of the fish. And there actually are fish picture in this picture, but they're small enough and they're far enough away, they're kind of hard to spot. OK. OK, here's a picture of a skeleton of a coral. The skeletons are white. It's calcium carbonate, which is the same material limestone and marble are made of. And it is relatively soft compared to many other terrestrial rocks. There are soft terrestrial rocks as well. Um, but this is a way, one species that we call staghorn. It looks like deer antlers. And it's hard and white. If you try to break it with your hand, you'll probably rip rip your fingers up before you break it. It's pretty strong. And then I was talking about the geological structure. Here's some that was dug out for uh, deepening a little harbor. And here's what the material underneath the living corals on the geological structure looked like. And you can see pieces of coral in there and lots of sand around them. And it's totally th soft. It can easily be broken apart, but it's a pile which can be as much as a mile deep with 60 million year old corals at the bottom under a lot of weight and compressed together. It gets a bit harder. Okay. Uh, Darwin came up with this theory which is still well supported and Hawaii is one of the very best examples that basically he said, okay, where did those atolls come from? He had a solution. He watched he looked at and saw uh, coral reefs, including atolls, when the little boat he was on uh, as a young man um, went through the Pacific. And he came up with this theory, and it's still a good theory today. And that is basically that volcanoes build up, and then they get little fringing reefs around in the shallow water. But after the volcano dies, the weight of it, or something, causes it to slowly subside and sink down in the ocean, and as it sinks, the reef grows up, and first it changes from a fringing reef to a barrier reef that has a space called the lagoon between it and the island, the mountain, and then eventually the island, the volcano, completely goes underwater and leaves just a ring of coral, which is exactly what we see, and all the evidence supports his theory. Here's some diagrams showing you more or less in actual pictures on the right, uh, diagrams from above in the middle and diagram from the side uh, of how that operation happens. There are other places in which different processes work. There are lines, okay, so for instance, in Hawaii, the big island has active volcanoes. Maui, the volcanoes are not active and it has fringing reefs. And by the time you get to the Northwest Islands, they turn into atolls. There's a little barrier reefs like uh, at Kaneohe Bay on Oahu. And then by the time you get to the northwest, they turn into atolls. And midway is a perfectly respectable ring of coral called an atoll. And so it fits very nicely. Um, so our next question is, what are, uh, are corals? Originally, scientists couldn't decide. They didn't know. You know, it didn't seem to move around. Uh, it was in, they lived in light. They seemed to be a little like plants, and yet maybe they were animals. So they called them zoophytes. Zo for animal, fight for plant. They didn't know. Eventually they discovered little things called polyps, and a polyp is what an anemone is. And anemones are a lot larger, and they are rather simple, and they don't make a skeleton. And in fact, the name for most of the corals is scleractinia. Scler means hard, actinia means anemone. It's like they're hard anemones. They're like they're anemones sitting on hard skeleton. So a polyp is this little 
uh, bag of water that has tentacles on it. It has three layers in their tissue. They have no organs. They're relatively simple. And uh, they have a little nerve net, no brain, no ganglia. They have muscle cells. Um, and they can sense and move. You can tickle them, and their tentacles will pull in, and the polyps will pull in. Here's a diagram. So there's a mouth, and it's basically like an open bag uh, with three layers of cells in the wall, which makes it very thin wall. And then the tentacles are just an extension, like fingers in a glove that are hollow. They're full of seawater that connects with the inside. They do digestion on the inside. It's called a vascular gastro cast, capa, uh, cavity. Excuse me. They're famous, particularly their relatives like the jellyfish, for being able to sting. And uh, basically, there are jellyfish, uh, and um, there uh, is one in Australia that can kill a human in two minutes. It is the most venomous, the most fast-killing venomous animal on the planet, and it's a jellyfish. Um, corals, you virtually no corals can you feel a sting. There's one kind that's called fire coral. If you touch it on the inside of your arm, you'll feel a sting. The sting will go away in a few minutes. There's no, uh, nothing left. The structure that does that is diagrammed here. It's officially called a nematocyst. It's a structure inside a cell made by the cell that is not alive. And it's basically a little explosive capsule. When something animal touches it, it builds up pressure until it has a pressure equal to that of a scuba tank, 2,000 pounds per square inch, but it's microscopic. And then suddenly, the little uh, lid on it breaks, and a uh, basically a harpoon, uh, it's a tube, it shoots out, and in about one millionth of a second, it's completely out and inside the uh, victim, and it's hollow, and it's full of venom with a whole bunch of very nasty chemicals in it, which injects. And so they basically invented the hypodermic needle oh, about a mere 500 million years before humans did. And it's soft. It's not hard metal. Um, but it pulls itself into the victim. So they're pretty amazing animals. And they're different kinds. And this is just a diagram of a bunch of different kinds. We don't have to. The, uh, ones where they have white bulbs on the right are the exploded ones, and they also, for each one, has a uh, picture. They coil up in the side of the thing, and they're produced by the cell. And uh, corals that build coral reefs have plants inside of them. Plants in a sort of um, common use of the term. They are little single cells that have chlorophyll and can do photosynthesis in sunlight. And here's a picture on the right. Uh, those little round things in the microscope pictures are the single cells. And we call them zooxanthellae, which really means little tiny algae inside of a host. It doesn't tell you what kind they are. They're actually in a group called dinoflagellates. And here's a picture, a close-up picture, of tiny polyps that are clear enough. You can see little green spots in them. And even every little green spot is a little green algae cell that is inside a coral cell. And when the sunlight hits, it makes food. It leaks food out. The polyp gets food from them. It's a uh, symbiotic relationship. It, it's mutually beneficial between both the coral polyp and the algae. And occasionally, the water gets too hot. And the coral basically throws the little algae out because the problem starts in the algae, and they're causing a problem for the coral, so the coral gets rid of them. It's called bleaching. They turn white. And basically what you're seeing is the dead skeleton. This is a picture of a tropical anemone that happened to be contracted up. And uh, I'll admit, I was trying to take a picture of the fish, and I like the colors, and so that's why I'm showing you. That's the body of the coral. I'll, I'll sucker for a pretty picture. I mean, I, I'll stoop to anything to uh, try to show you a pretty picture. But this is the way they can actually look. And then when the tentacle's out, they look like this. And they're like a shag carpet. carpet. They have all these tentacles. And of course, they're close relatives of corals. They just don't make a skeleton. 
And here's a picture of some coral polyps of different sizes and shapes. There's about uh, 830 species currently recognized. We know there's lots more species of coral that haven't been named yet. And this is some variety. And the lower right hand is a picture of the microscopic algae. They're actually all brown. And so all colors of corals, other than brown, are colors that are in the coral uh, tissue in the coral cells, not the algae, because they're always brown, unlike the picture we saw before where they look green. I'm not dead sure why they look green. There are a few corals that sure look like anemones to me. I don't know about you, but I would never have thought that was a hard coral. This is a hard coral that has a skeleton in it that's hard, and this one's not attached. You can actually pick it up, show it around to your friends, and put it back. And it looks just like an anemone because it has huge tentacles. Here's a very close relative that has tiny tentacles. Many corals have their ten tentacles pulled in during the day. They use the stingers on their tentacles to catch little tiny animals in the water at night. And then they pull them in during the day. So fish, like butterfly fish, who think that tentacles are just yummy, like to eat them during the day. They pull their tentacles in. Ha ha, you can't get me. And that's why they have skeletons, is to make it hard for predators like fish to eat their tentacles. And here's one looking down. This is a single polyp. Coral polyps get up to, there's one species that gets to a foot diameter. It's this kind, this very kind. And the little crack in the middle is their mouth. So this is one polyp with one mouth, and it's huge. But most coral species have tiny polyps. The polyps are about one millimeter diameter, smaller than a pencil lead. And they have millions on a big colony. American Samoa has a colony that is eight meters tall. And it has a circumference of about 39 meters. It's the size of a house. And it's all alive. And uh, it is probably about four or 500 years old. I've forgotten the estimate. Uh, they have a pretty good estimate. Excuse me. This is what the skeleton looks like from underneath this coral. OK? It's white, calcium. And it shows all the shape, but not the color. The tissue on corals is often so thin, it looks like uh, it, a thin layer of paint on the skeleton, which is white. And the, all the species are all defined by the skeleton, even though species are live organisms and skeletons are dead. Uh, and skeleton is not a very good term because it's only one piece. They don't use it for moving around like we do. Although the polyp can move around attached to the coral, they don't walk around, they don't have multiple bones and move around like you and I do. Here's one with moderate sized polyps. Each loop, there is a polyp. Here's a smaller one. They're about finger size. They like little volcanoes on this one. And on this one, every tiny bump is a polyp. And almost all, well, most corals, the most common size is just a polyp a millimeter in diameter tiny. And often, when we're trying to identify species, we'd like to know things about the polyp cup. And it's so small. And now my vision is not nearly as good as yours, and I'm struggling trying to tell them apart. And that's old person's disease. Uh, it happens. Um, reproduction. Corals reproduce, of course, and some methods of reproduction are not terribly different from us. Uh, many species have separate sexes, but most of them are hermaphrodites and have both eggs and sperm. And a majority of them release eggs and sperm into the water, and it's up to them to try to find each other, basically swimmer, uh, sperm are swimming around and fertilize eggs. In some cases, uh, the egg is retained inside of the parent, and the sperm have to swim in, fertilize it, and then it grows into a, a, a larva inside, uh, which then swims out in the water and can go find a place to attach and grow. And those are sexual methods of reproduction. Um, a majority are uh, hermaphro simultaneous hermaphrodites, have both sexes. A minority have separate sexes. And um, so the ones that uh, keep the larvae are called brooders. And then there's asexual reproduction, which we don't do. We're not capable of doing. But basically, a piece of a coral can break off 
As a diver, occasionally you'll hit a coral and break off a piece, whether you want to or not, unless you're way far away and not looking carefully at them. I have to get up close, and so I've done more than my share of breaking corals, I confess. Uh, but actually, that's a method of reproduction. Um, and basically what happens if a piece is broken off and it lands on a hard surface and it isn't being moved by waves, it can attach and start a whole new colony, which can then grow. It's a way to reproduce. Um, if humans could do that, you could have your finger broken off, glue it onto a table, and have it grow into a baby. But you can't do that, all right? None of us can. But they do it all the time. So they do a few things that are, uh, are a little bit unusual. The ones, some of the branches actually appear to be uh, selected by evolution to not break because the investment, the piece they lose is relatively large compared to a larva. And larvae, they can produce huge numbers of tiny things with their ability to uh, invest. Each organism has a limit to how much energy and material they can put into rep reproduction. And um, having a big branch break off, which may not survive, is a high investment which they may lose. And so on a branch, often the base is very sor solid and strong and bigger, and the tip is very little bit of material in the skeleton and is easily broken. That's exactly what you want to resist leverage. You don't want, you have to have it strong at the base to resist that you don't have to have it at the tip. So that suggests that bearing, being selected to minimize that kind of breakage. Okay. Um, so I think I've talked enough about skeleton. Um, and uh, a, a question that you could ask uh, is kind of like uh, what kids do sometimes in a little game where you're trying to guess something. Is it plant? animal or mineral. And in fact, what a coral is, is all three. It's an animal that has plants in it that makes a mineral. Something we don't do, except we do make a mineral skeleton. Um, and um, so, uh, and corals, like a lot of or organisms now, are called a holobiont because they are actually colonized by lots of kinds of microorganisms. Most of our microorganisms are in our digestive system, but some are on our skin. And they don't have dry skin dead cells to keep nasty uh, kinds of microbes that are disease causing out of them. They only have mucus on their skin. How they manage to survive? Water is full of organisms. Hey, there was a, an estimate, I think a teaspoon has something like, of seawater has an average of maybe 80 million viruses in it. A teaspoon of salt water? Anybody ever swallow a couple of drops when they're swimming? Uh, uh. Thank heavens none of those infect us. Uh, and it's because organisms in salt water have to be able to survive in salt water, and uh, we don't have salt water inside us. Ours, our water inside our cells is dilute salt water, and they can't survive in that. Uh, that's my explanation, or attempt to. Uh, I often make things up when people ask me a question. I try to make up <laughs> an, a plausible answer, and then I tell them, hey, I just made that up, so at least you know that I made it up, but hey, I don't know all the answers, let me tell you. Um, so, you know, she said I was going to answer questions. I'm going to try to. That's the best I can do. Okay. So let me go ahead. Um, there's a bunch of... Uh, uh, one little interesting thing about diversity is in general, in highly diverse ecosystems, most species are rare. That actually makes it difficult for us to find them to study. Um, if, you only, if you're in, say, the Arctic, uh, there's just a few species of birds, there's a few species of this, a few of that. They're easy to find, there's just a few of them to study and you get in a place which is really rich with diversity. There's huge numbers, most of them are rare, they're hard to find, they're hard to study, um, and it's wonderful, but it certainly keeps us busy.
So these are maps of the diversity. The sort of black area is the highest diversity, and as they go through reds and oranges to yellows, uh, and the top, uh, that's lower and lower diversity, and the top is corals, and the bottom is fish. They have the same basic pattern um, of where the highest diversity is, but coral reefs are not all the same. There's high diversity ones, and there's low diversity ones. On the west coast of the uh, Americas, in a place like Panama, reefs typically are on the size of this room, and they have up to about 10 species, usually dominated by one species. When I was in the Philippines, I looked, uh, a fellow asked me to tell him how many species of coral were on this rock that was about this big and this big. I found 40 species in this little tiny rock, because I spent a whole dive looking, oh, there's another one. Oh, oh, there's another one. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I already talked about big fish and fisheries. Um, there's complex action. You know, for every diverse species, many species, there's lots of different kinds of interactions between them. So how are reefs doing? That's what I was going to talk about from the beginning. Oh, I finally got my, my topic. Oh, wow, isn't that wonderful? Oh, we have five minutes left to go. OK, so how are reefs doing? <laughs> Coral reefs. Uh, seemed to me when I was young to be just fine. And then I went on a trip when I was in grad school to Jamaica. I was just a snorkeler. I hadn't yet been certified to scuba dive. And I got to see the glory of that reef. And next year, a hurricane hit it that had 30-foot tall waves and flattened it. And in shallow water, basically almost every, not everything, but everything was broken. Some of the pieces were alive. And then about two years later, in 1983-84, the uh, urchins started dying. There were huge numbers of black urchins with foot-long spines. You can't touch them without getting stuck in them. They have a tiny bit of venom that kind of hurt, and you wish you never touched it, which is the purpose of the spines. They're defensive. They were masses of them all over. Next time I went to the reefs, I didn't see any. And I didn't really notice it ha what had happened. But people reported it happening at different islands at different times. And it turned out it went around the entire Caribbean in the direction of the currents. Something was carried. There was a disease that killed them and basically got current. And nobody had the smarts to preserve, to freeze or otherwise preserve any of the, of the urchins or put them under a microscope to find out what the disease is, and we've never found out. But 90% of them died, and they were the last herbivore eating algae. Algae compete with corals. Used to be lots of fish that could eat the algae, but guess what? In a place like Jamaica, they, don't, they aren't rich like the United States is, and they needed them for food, and they've been fishing them so heavily that when I went there, Almost all the fish I saw were in fish traps. Never let people catch reef fish with traps. They work in the night, in the day, when the fisherman's not out there, and they can catch the very last fish. And they're hugely overfished, and the herbivore, herbivorous fish are all gone. Then the urchins were all gone. Guess what happened? Here's a graph. The top graph shows how much coral cover, live coral cover were, was, and it basically fell off a cliff. There was almost nothing left. Look what happened to the algae in the bottom graph. They exploded. When I, next time I came back to the Jamaica, it was all algae. There was almost no coral. There's a little bit of coral, and it's never recovered. That was 1980. It's now 2023, over 40 years, no sign of recovery. This is possibly what might happen around the world. And there have been other disasters other places. But in the Pacific, they recover. In the Caribbean, they don't. And that's probably because of all kinds of other things that humans do, like overfishing, sediment runoff, nutrients runoff, and a laundry list of other things. Um, some are really nasty, some are less and less, and some are very minor. Um, here's a graph of how they lost, lost coral in the uh, Caribbean, uh, of the whole Caribbean. And basically, it went down and down uh, from, what, nearly 80%, nearly 60%, about 50% cover of live coral down to about 8%. 
and that's where they are now. And Florida is about 16% or less, and it's in ter they're in terrible shape. When it happens in the Pacific, corals usually recover, so far. And I'm hoping that part of it is that we're tiny islands in a gigantic sea, and the human effects are not quite as bad. Um, so, what are the major re effects to coral reefs? There are natural disturbances, like hurricanes. Hurricanes were here on Earth probably soon after oceans formed a few billion years ago, and they've been here a whole time. And coral reefs are very recent. They're only a few hundred, only a few hundred million years old at the most. And uh, they happen to coral reefs, and coral reefs recover. And part of that is they're very brief with long periods in between. The very worst is to be right near the eye of a category five hurricane. That's what hit Jamaica. Um, and when it hits, it can actually flatten a reef. But with decades in between, most likely, they can recover, and they do. Um, there was a place in the, Car in the Philippines I won f went on my first trip to the Philippines, and there was an area with nothing alive, no, nothing but dead skeletons of coral. I asked people, what happened? They said, oh, we had a hurricane. 11 years later, I went back. I couldn't find the spot. Where is it? Where is it? It was like 100% live coral, wonderful coral. Um, and they can recover, but that's partly because there's zillions of reef area around with zillions of coral, all producing larvae. They settle, bingo, it comes back. If you have no other reefs left alive, you're in real trouble. Okay, human things, there's a whole bunch of them. Here's a, a picture, satellite picture of a hurricane, typhoon, or uh, cyclone. Those are just different names. They're all the same kind of storm. They rotate one way in the north hemisphere, another way in the south, and uh, they're very destructive, but very brief. And there's a long pause usually between one and the next. Crown of thorn starfish is a major problem in the Pacific. They've done a lot of damage. Um, corals can recover if they have time. And we're finding that you can kill them. And basically, there's this new uh, research. If you kill them enough, you can actually control them and have uh, continue to have good coral cover. A Caribbean doesn't have this problem until some stupid person introduces them there, at least. Um, and coral disease is the major thing that killed corals in the Caribbean. That's probably the number one culprit. But a lot of other things have been helping as well. Uh, coral disease uh, killed over 90% of two of the three most common corals in the Caribbean, both of which are staghorn and elkhorn uh, corals. Um, they only have two species. And basically all the natural threats are now being made bigger by assistance from humans. And then there are major human threats are, uh, that are totally done by humans. And basically uh, uh, global warming is causing these hot water periods that kill large numbers of corals uh, through the process called bleaching, overfishing, nutrients, sediment, invasive species. Somebody in Miami let uh, a lionfish uh, that got too large in their aquarium, they put them out in the ocean. They can produce a, f a floating mass of eggs with 200,000 eggs about every two weeks. That's what an adult can do. And they have a big mouth and they suck in little fish and have huge effects on the fish population. It's really terrible. And introduced and invasive species are almost impossible to get rid of. There is no chance until we find out, find a way of using genetics to destroy them. Only one example I know of has ever gotten rid of an invasive species Prickly pear cactus from the Americas, cactus are only in the Americas, were introduced into Australia. They got loose. They couldn't control them. Somebody found a tiny little moth that eats the flower and brought it, and it only eats the flower off prickly, prickly pear. And between that and removal efforts, they completely got rid of it from Australia. That's the only case, and there's loads. There's like 3,500 invasive species known in the world, and probably more exist. So they're a real problem. Here shows bleaching, but guess what? This is a hope message right here. This is American Samoa. On the left, 
in the water at the exact same temperature as the ones on the right. The ones on the left are totally bleached. They've lost all their algae. They're in deep trouble. A little bit hotter and they'll die. The ones on the right have all their algae still in them. They're genetically different and they're resistant. And they are the hope, the ones on the right, that they can reproduce and basically replant the reef. And there are a lot of people trying to use them to grow them and plant them out and get them across the reef and re-establish uh, coral populations that are more resistant to high temperatures and bleaching. Um, so this is a ray of hope. This is an example of overfishing. This is a proud Samoan uh, spear fisherman who has legally speared and caught a humphead wrasse, which is a species that gets to seven feet long. In Guam, it's, you can sell them for $11 a pound, where normal fish are $2 a pound, and they can easily weigh over 100 pounds. That's $1,100 for an hour's work. It's irresistible. And uh, they have to go deeper and deeper to find them, the big ones and stuff. Um, that's a fairly resistant species, actually. But the big fish are always eliminated first. And the Northwest Hawaiians is swarming with sharks and giant trevally that are about this big. Uh, they're wonderful, uh, amazing fish. This is a picture of an effects of sediment that happened after a uh, hurricane in American Samoa. Here's an invasive lionfish that is now, they're more common in the Caribbean now where they're not native than they are in the Pacific where they came from. Maybe because the predators know, know how to eat them without getting stung. Those spines are very venomous. I once touched one accidentally. I regretted it like you wouldn't believe. It feels like you know, somebody's taking a hammer and smashing your finger. You stick it in wa hot water, as hot as you can take it without being burned, and it hurts even worse. And about 20 minutes later, hey, this is getting better. Another 20 minutes, no pain left. If you don't do it, it can hurt that way for about a week. You don't want this to happen. And the fish, you know, it has all these fins. It scares the little fish into a corner and then sucks it in into its giant mouth. They're pretty. And people like them from the aquarium. They get too big, and then they want to release them. So what can we do about this? The good thing is we know what the causes of the problem are, and we know what to fix. So let's get to work and do it. What's the bloody problem? Anyhow, the problem is that people don't want to do it. Why don't they want to do it? Because they're getting some kind of benefit. So it's easy to see with fisheries. Particularly there's, you know, in the Philippines, I li worked there two years. And I figured out after a while that those fishermen along the shore are so poor that if they don't catch fish during the day, their family may go hungry that night. That's how close they are to starvation. And it's not a choice. It's, it's life or death. And the biggest advantage, the biggest benefit to humans that coral reefs probably offer is keeping those people alive. That's how stark it is. And if bleaching kills those corals, those people are in very cheap trouble. Uh, it's going to be a human catastrophe, really. Um, what are we going to do? Philippines has 110 million people. Indonesia is the fourth largest population country in the world with 230 million people. And many of them live off the coast and survive partly off fish. What a fisherman does is trade part of his catch for rice, because you can get a lot of rice for a, a few fish, and that keeps them survive. Th the other benefits are things like shoreline protection. Your shoreline erodes if the coral reefs are gone, because the reefs, uh, the waves are much larger. They break the waves, and you could end up with your house underwater as the uh, shoreline or roads. There's a rule of thumb that um, a uh, inch of uh, a one unit of sea level rise leads to 125 units of shoreline erosion. Guess what we've got coming down the road at us? Because a foot, two feet, probably at least three feet, feet by 2,100 of uh, sea level rise, maybe more if we don't get our act under uh, uh, in gear and uh, stop emitting. And we got to really reduce and stop. And actually, I, uh, the big ray of hope is the United States has passed a law to do that. Not enough, more will be needed, but it is a really good start of reducing emissions.
and it is the biggest threat to coral reefs. Well, we know all these human things like sediment and nutrients, and we need to reduce them, and we need to reduce... Uh, why is it doing that? Oh, it's because I'm touching one of the touch keys. Lovely. Okay, maybe I can get out of it. Okay, so I talked about benefits is why we do. Um, basically, people talk about, uh, the third thing is tourism. And of course, Hawaii, part of your tourism is coral reef tourism. And there are places in the world where it's huge. So for instance, the Great Barrier Reef, reef tourism brings about $6 billion, possibly 12, to Australia per year. Alive, that reef is worth solid gold. Dead, it isn't worth a darn thing, right? In the Caribbean, it's about $6 billion for poor people who don't have other income. Florida, it's about $6 billion. It's gold. Don't let it die. The amount, if you have an investment of a million dollars and somebody says, you want to lose that? If you don't, you better do this. It only costs 100 bucks. Are you going to say, oh, no, that's too much money, huh? That's the way coral reefs are, you know? The amount we've spent is piddly compared to the value. And it's, the value is both money and lives. In poor countries, it's not money. It's lives of people, and that's serious. Okay, so in environmental battles, my opinion is there are some that we've been winning. People don't like to be poisoned, you know? Chemicals in the environment start poisoning people, and people get mad about it. And they can push their governments to do something, and the United States and many countries have done that. You know, air in big cities is not perfect, but it's a whole lot better than it was. London fog, that's actually smoke from burning coal in fireplaces. And in some of their worst episodes, thousands of people died in London. You look at it now, walk around, clear area. You know, it's one of the large cities in the world. Tokyo used to have air so bad, they had machines vending oxygen on the sidewalk for people who needed it. Now, walk around, is there a problem? Oh, sure, it's not perfect, but nothing like what it used to be. America's Clean Air and Clean Water Acts have done wonders. But there's a lot left to do, and particularly the natural environment. We have more domestic animals for our food, chickens, uh, cattle, and all the other farm animals, than the entire weight of all wild animals on Earth. That's how bad we're treating our planet that we live on. We need to hand off what we have to our next generation in one piece. So, I think environmental battles are endless. They can often be won, but sometimes, particularly for coral reefs, they're extremely hard to win. So, anyhow, that, my answer to my original question is yes, we can save free coral reefs. But will we? I don't know the answer to that. We have to do it. We must do it. And if you've seen the glory of coral reefs, you want to do it. That's one of the great things about coral reefs that we have on our side, is they are so beautiful that they are charismatic. People love them. If there's a group of people, the divers, there are divers who wait until, they can't wait until they have enough money for their next trip. They love it. And they need to be able ready to fight for coral reefs with the rest of us. So we have some decent left. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Can we get another round of applause for Doug Fenner with that very emotional but very driving talk. Thank you very much, Doug.
All righty, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna enter into our question and answer session. I have my lovely assistants over here who are gonna go up on the stairwells on either side um, and we're gonna do that question and answer session. We're gonna keep it to 15 minutes, so don't worry if Doug doesn't get to your question. You'll have plenty of time to hang out with him during the book signing, uh, but if I could have you guys go up each of the stairwells and if you guys have a question, just raise your hand and I'm gonna try and direct them to whoever has their hand up first so we can kind of do it in order and I'm gonna have you go to that gentleman right up there at the top. Thank you. I will try to answer questions. <laughs> and I'll make something up otherwise. Aloha and mahalo. So since we have two or three hours to continue the discussion, <laughs> <laughs> what perspective can you, can you share with our Lahaina fires and the oh. concern for toxic organic runoff, whether it be uh, uh, fluorides or, or arsenic, uh, and the efforts with Soylic to try to contain that, and the potential damage. What, what's your perspective on what we're facing? Great question. Let's see if I can make something up. Um, <laughs> obviously, chemicals can kill corals easily. Depends on the chemical, depends on the concentration. This would appear to be a new type of event. Um, and I don't have expertise really to give you an accurate answer. It's quite possible that it will do damage, could kill any remaining coral, I don't know. And maybe, uh, you know, it will depend on what the chemicals are, what their concentrations are, and I don't know that. Um, but people are going to find out. So the answer may be coming, but it won't come from me, I'm afraid. Because uh, I don't think, I can't think of another event that is similar, really, for coral reefs. So we're entering to unknown territory, it would seem to me. Um, but it's probably a good thing to, you know, think that there could be really bad effects. But I certainly don't know what they are, so uh, I, I, I'll just confess that I don't have a clue, okay? Uh, sorry. Uh, but we'll, the, we'll the find fact, out. The information you'd said that this is an unprecedented event, that in itself is, is, is very informative. That they're, 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 we don't have any, yeah. anything yeah. to compare or contrast with. Yeah, and, and you know, I don't know everything about coral reefs. It turns out the literature I discovered the hard way is, is gigantic. And there's a section of over 200 pages in here trying to uh, summarize what we know about the ecology of coral reefs. And basically, I found out there was almost an unlimited amount of literature I have not yet read. And give me about three to five years of doing nothing else, and there's a slim chance that I might be able to get to the end of that literature. But I've never heard of a similar uh, thing, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist, I hate to tell you. So, uh, lots of uncertainty and not much of an answer, sorry. Indeed, uh, but much mahalo. Yeah, yeah, thank you. What else? Alrighty, we're gonna come, we're gonna wait for him to make his way back down the stairs. We're gonna make him exercise this evening. We're gonna go right here, and then you had your hand up right after that. Oh. oh. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say also thank you for sharing your passion. Like, it's, it's really, it's, it's apparent and it's infectious, and, and appreciate that. Um, in the, so there was a photo where you had shown kind of on the left the bleaching and the right. Um, so was that just naturally occurring resistance? And is that something, um, I don't know if you know a lot about genetic diversity in coral, but is, is it an organism that tends to have a lot of diversity and a lot of change that, or is it kind of a slower um, process, I guess, to get that genetic right. diversity into a population? In their morphology, in their shape of the corals, there's huge variation. For us people who try to distinguish corals, the operational word being try, uh, it's a huge barrier. There's variation in all sizes and all features. It's all over the place. And at least some of it is probably due to environment to some degree. And different corals are in different environments at different depths and all sorts of things like that. But a lot of it's probably genetic. 
you can easily see two corals side by side. As far as you can tell, they're in the same environment, and they're quite different. And those two corals are a good example. I think that's likely to be genetic. And that's a hope. That's a ray of hope. Those corals that resist it, they've still got their algae. And the other ones, I've seen places where all the corals are dead except a few, and they still have their algae. They're the Schwarzeneggers of coral, you know? <laughs> oh, and they're the hope for the next generation that they can. The basics of evolution, basically, are mortality um, among one group that's genetically different from another group, and the others survive. And the next generation is almost all or many more of the ones that survived. We come from a long line of survivors and a long trail of those who didn't survive also happened, but we're not descended from them. We're descended from the survivors. And hopefully the corals can do it. As long as not all the individuals get killed, the more the mortality, the faster the evolution goes. And a lot of people don't understand that when you use antibiotics to kill the uh, bacteria that are infecting you, you have to kill every one of them. Because if you don't, the mo toughest ones will survive and they'll come back and soon they are resistant to antibiotics. And then they get resistant to multiple antibiotics. And if they resist every one of them, people who get that are essentially doomed. The only way to get to survive is to cut the infected part out of you. And it's evolution that does it. And it's whether we like it or not. So you kill them all or else they'll kill you. It's that severe. So all you have to have is have some of them survive and kill lots of them. So the fastest way to get resistance is huge mortality. It means we have to go through gigantic mortality on coral reefs. That's not a nice thing, but it may be the best way of our being out. What people are trying to do is to breed those uh, resistant ones, breed them in captivity, select ones that are even tougher, do more generations. That's selective breeding. It's what we've been doing with dogs for, and horses and pigeons and lots of other animal species that we use. And there are all these domestic variations. It works really well. And then plant those out. The trick is, there's a reef 1,500 miles long. Do you think you can plant enough corals in all that reef? Australia is coming up to the, to the forefront in terms of supporting. They have over 300 people working on selective breeding and what tolerating all kinds of things about reef planting reefs. You name it, they've got scientists and people working out how to do it. They're really investing. The United States is not as far as I know. I mean, the projects are there, but they're small compared to what Australia is doing. So at least somebody's doing it. And Australia is the only developed country with large amounts of coral reef. And so they basically decided, and their government decided, maybe because the people were pushing them, to spend some, and it's peanuts compared to uh, all sorts of other things. So there are rays of hope, and we can do it. Let's get going and do it. <laughs> I think we need more passion. You saw a bit of passion for me. Many science love, scientists love the reef, and there are people who have studied a particular reef and love it, and they see it all killed, and they cry in their mouths because it's so terrible. But there is hope. OK, let's do another question. Sorry, I'm going on and on. Thank you so much for your talk. My question is about just doing it. So what are some, in your opinion, what are some actions that managers should be pushing for and supporting in order to increase resilience in our reefs? Well, uh, I didn't really say it, but there are global uh, threats and there are local threats. And the local threats are really the ones that we have the best leverage to make immediate changes. Overfishing is one. Sediments, nutrients, those are the biggies. Um, diseases are a threat, but it's hard to come up with a good thing to do with diseases. But the other ones, it's very clear. We need to stop 
those sediments running off of construction and uh, agriculture. You know, but people don't want to do it because it's going to cost them money. Yeah, that's the biggest thing. Or uh, in poor countries where they're desperate for food, we're asking them to starve. We have to find other ways for people to get what they need to do get without damaging the reef. Nobody goes out on coral reefs and says, oh, I'm going to kill some corals today. Is this that a good thing? No, nobody does that. What they do is they do things that help their pocketbook or feed them, and they have unintended consequences that are bad for coral reefs. So we just need to, that's easier said than done, by orders of magnitude, you know? Trying to call, call, you know, talk to uh, regulators about controlling overfishing. You will hit a stone wall. In Florida, they were going to expand to 5% of the National Marine Sanctuary to be closing to fishing. In Key West, they rioted and burned an effigy, the leader of the government organization that were for the sanctuary. That's how, what the opposition was like. You can have rioting in the streets. You can't tell me not to fish. Yeah, and these are people, you know, Americans are not, most of them, not poor. Those fish are, you know, Florida is full of these uh, speedboats that cost thousands and thousands of dollars. I've never seen so many of them. Expensive engines and stuff. They're having it for fun. They have a two-day lobster fishery that's open fishing in Florida before the commercial fishery and 50,000 divers come and wipe out 80 to 90% of all the lobsters in two days. Tell me there's no fish problem with fishing, but try to change it and you will have screams like you've never heard in your life. And these are rich people. I have sympathy for the people that are gonna to starve to death. I don't have a lot of sympathy for these people. It's just fun for them. Oh my gosh. Uh, and you know, uh, uh, building construction things, there's big money involved. Huh. Yeah, so uh, we're up against uh, uh, significant problems to try. We know what to do, but to do it, oh my, oh my. So anyhow, yeah, let's get another one. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Yep. And <laughs> if you are thinking of a question, uh, make sure you hang on to it, because Doug will be able to answer some in person. I'll try, I'll try. Thank you for being here, and thank you for allowing the last question. Um, can you briefly expand a little bit on the health uh, of the coral reef system here in the state of Hawaii and what may be your prognosis for the next five, 10 years, if you have any clarity on that, that would oh. be helpful, thank you. Okay, in the book there is a chapter at the end, a section at the end about Hawaiian coral reefs. And I asked uh, my friend Eric Brown and he asked uh, uh, Alan Friedlander to, they wrote it together, and one of the things in it is a graph of how much coral area has been lost or gained, what the change has been. I think from since 1990, it's in the book, I've forgotten exactly the date, and um, basically, Hawaii as a whole has not had coral losses. Maui, it's down, but it's only down a few percent. So it's, it's virtually barely at the level of being significant. Uh, it's nothing like the Caribbean or Florida have had. And it's much like what's happened in the rest of the Pacific. So, so far, it's not very bad. Now, there are obviously place, individual places where it has been bad. But these are surveys that go all the way around in more or less random locations, not just looking for the bad stories and stuff. And the news is pretty darn good so far. And that's like the Great Barrier Reef that had huge losses, but then it came back. Wonderful. What's it going to do next time? The fact is there come these events that kill corals like bleaching. They used to be like 20 years apart. Now they're six years apart. They're getting closer because they're happening more often. And pretty soon, the corals will come up a little bit and then they'll get killed. They'll come up a little bit and then they'll get killed. They'll come up a little bit and then they'll get killed. And it's a ratchet system. You know how you do a bolt? You make it go one way, even though the thing goes back and forth? Down big, up little, down big. Guess where that's going? The future is very bad for all the reefs of the world 
because global warming is affecting the entire world. And right this year, it's scary because we are over the map the, the previous. So previous years in the summer, if you look at all the world's temperature, uh, it's different in different areas, but it's in a bandwidth. This year, we're way above any other previous year for world temperature of the surface. And recently in Florida, they had such bad bleaching, there was a reef in which 100% of the corals were killed. That's not looking good. Right now, the uh, Red Sea has bad bleaching. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm sitting there in American Samoa with healthy reefs, and it looks like when summer gets there, and summer there is winter here, so long down December, January, somewhere in there, we have, may have very nasty beaching in the southern hemisphere. But we're in deep trouble, and almost all everything is pointing towards trouble in the future, but it heavily depends on what we do. Can we keep the world temperature below 1.5 C degrees increase since the Industrial Revolution started? That's an open question. It doesn't look good at this point. And at 1.5, the estimate is that 90% of the world's corals will be killed. At 2.5, probably 98%. And we could be even worse. Right now, we're on schedule for something like 3.6. It's terrible if we don't get going. And the biggest thing is reducing emissions. And it, it's a little like a, uh, if you're uh, in a medical unit like MASH in a war, you have to do triage. People come in, this guy's got a scratch on his foot. This guy has a bleeding aorta. Who do you treat? You treat the guy with the aorta because if you don't, he's going to die in 10 minutes, maybe two minutes. The other guy with a scratch, he doesn't need any help. You can do that when you're... So we have things that are terrible threats and we have minor threats. We can cure all the minor threats. So make it uh, illegal to have any sunscreen at all. You'll have a lot of people with uh, cancer and you will have no effect on whether corals live or die. Not a single coral has been documented in the wild to have been killed by uh, sunscreen. Not one. The number for bleaching is probably in the billions. No one knows. It's so huge. So which one are we going to treat? I, maybe sunscreen is doable. We still need to do it. But we better tackle the worst one or we can kiss our reefs goodbye. That's the bottom line. And many countries, their pledges aren't enough, and they're not doing their pledges. The United States has stepped up, and Australia's working hard to help corals. But we have to do a lot more. So I don't know what the future is. It depends on what we do much more than what the natural system is. It's not their fault. It's our fault. Thank you very much, Doug. Can we get another round of applause for Doug? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, folks, so much for coming again. We really appreciate you turning out for Doug. I think uh, everyone in the audience can agree with me that sometimes with science, we've got these rose-colored glasses, and we uh, don't get to look at the emotional side. But it is very important to recognize that there's a lot of emotion that still goes on in our field. So I can feel the emotion in the room tonight. Um, I just wanted to let my audience know that we're going to take a brief, we'll call it an intermission. Uh, we're going to take a break for about five minutes in order to move Doug over into the Maui Ocean Treasures gift store. Um, you guys are more than welcome to descend the stairs. There are restrooms just outside on this side. Also the ability to roam around in the exhibit hall. And then uh, our staff will let you guys know when Doug is all settled in the Maui Ocean uh, Treasures gift shop in order to do book signings. Um, and just a couple of extra notes. I think I may have mentioned some of them already, but uh, Maui Ocean Center is the exclusive retailer for the new book, Corals of Hawaii. If you haven't seen it yet, I'm excited for you guys to see it. Um, if you're familiar with the first edition, they are out of print, so it is extremely difficult to get a hold of a first copy, and if you do, it's extremely expensive 
Doug, you're very expensive. <laughs> um, and uh, we will be hosting not only a book signing tonight, but if you have any uh, friends or family that weren't able to come out with us this evening, for those of you folks that are watching online this evening in the hybrid event, uh, Doug will actually be joining us tomorrow as well from 11 to 1 to be doing a book signing in Maui Ocean Treasures as well. So make sure that you guys stop in and encourage your friends and family to stop in if they didn't get a chance to. And uh, thank you guys so much. We'll reconvene uh, in about five minutes over at Maui. Ocean Treasures. Mahalo, everyone.